Okay. Welcome everyone to Me, Myself and I um, exhibition uh, talk. Uh, I'm Rosalind Davis, I'm the curator um, at Collie Bristow Gallery and I'm delighted to have you with us and some of the artists in the show. Um, the show started in February, but unfortunately because of COVID, um, it went into lockdown and eventually we needed to take the work out of the building because it wasn't in use. Um, so uh, normally we would get the chance to have lots of the artists together and I do private tours and talks throughout the show. And although it's over, we still wanted to um, have this conversation on Zoom, which will, is being recorded just so you're aware. Um, and uh, we'll go on to YouTube or other platform at a later date. Um, so if somebody's missed it or you want to forward it on, then please do. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming, as I say. Um, just for those of you I know will not have been to the gallery necessarily, uh, particularly in the case of during lockdown. Um, Collier Bristow Gallery is a gallery and a law firm. Um, and it's been going for 28 years and is about supporting and championing um, artists um, with a focus on early career artists and, and how we, um, or how I approach that is to sort of combine uh, early career artists with say somebody like Ken Kiff who's in the, the, uh, the image on the left hand side. Um, so these were, there were 20 uh, artists in the show, 45 artworks. Um, and today the format I'm going to be using is essentially to take you on a tour that I would have taken you on if I was in person. And so forgive uh, the, the, the being a PowerPoint and not loads of live videos or virtual galleries, but um, I'm lo-fi. <laughs> um, so um, also as well with me, myself and I, I think with every show that I curate, um, I want it to be resonant <laughs> over time. Now, obviously we didn't know that COVID was happening, but I just found it very um, interesting that it started to resonate in very different ways, which is some of the things I wanted to talk about. But me, myself and I essentially is um, from a song um, and, and about identity. And it is um, very much about self-inquiry and expressions of the interior self, as well as that sort of represented in the exterior. Um, so it spoke to lots of lived experiences of recalling personal and political struggles, family relationships and memories of childhood across all kinds of artworks and art forms that the show reflected on freedoms and solitude, collectivity and belonging, disenfranchisement and loss, uh, which just even saying those words um, is particularly poignant um, and people grappling with the sort of complexities of identity of selfhood and trying to find your place in the world. Um, yeah, and it's, it's become much more political than I intended in the sense of, of what is being presented and how, as I say, it resonates. I keep saying that word, it's hard to find another one that says, says it, but um, also very subdued, you know, the show was open for a very short length of time in a way, and I sort of imagined all these um, artworks just consoling each other in this empty space. <laughs> um, and very isolated, uh, which further sort of emphasised that, that theme. Um, so uh, starting with um, Charmaine's work, oh sorry, actually Wendy, first of all, actually, uh, but we'll come back to Wendy, but Wendy um, is a fantastic artist and she was uh, positioned here in the, in the gallery as a sort of watchful face, but we'll come back to Wendy as well. Um, Paul is going to speak a little bit about her work. Um, but yeah, she was by the library, um, this kind of portrait of knowledge that, was when, that is in Wendy's work, uh, an expression yet no features. Um, they're very powerful pieces. Um, so we'll come back to, obviously, most people had multiple works in the show or they'll talk about one or two of them. Um, so that's Wendy's and there's another triptych in the show. Um, so we'll come back. Um, but at the very beginning of the uh, gallery in the reception area were these um, two powerful drawings by Charmaine, um, which are about heritage, family, identity, and the wider mysteries of the universe and her memory stories. Um, and again, sort of reading it in slightly different ways. I mean, Charmaine, would you say a few words about them, but maybe we can talk a bit about how they say a little bit more than maybe your initial original intention given the times that we're in. Yeah, 
Yes, uh, interesting. Uh, the the um, three women on the left, um, by the way, they're all life-sized drawings and I draw myself, uh, but I don't view them as self-portraits. I use my image as a vehicle to um, tell stories, wider stories about um, cultural diaspora experience. Um, so um, the three figures on the left, I made that work. I started it at the end of 2016. And at the time when I started that work, um, I didn't feel that there was enough said about my parents' generation who came here um, in the 60s um, to help rebuild post-war Britain. And um, I was inspired by, um, found a passport of my mum's and in it, it says uh, to allow the bearer to pass freely without let or hindrance and to afford the bearer um, protections where necessary. And that really stood out for me because um, that wasn't their experience when they came here. So um, I kind of used the three graces as a trope to kind of map a story of um, arrival, uh, settlement and um, you know, just wanted to kind of expand the experiences um, of um, of them living here. So it's kind of a combined memory piece. So it's combined with my memory, my generation's memories, with um, my parents' experiences. So the figure on the right hand side is the young maiden setting out on her journey um, to kind of. Um, you know, fulfill this dream of uh, making a better life. The figure in the middle is um, the person who's settling here, but is going through a lot of um, difficulty and discrimination. Um, and I kind of remember a lot of kind of protests and marches when I was growing up. So that's kind of very much, um, you know, we're here in spite of the fact, you know, that we're going through all this um, pain. And the figure on the left is, uh, I see her as the crone, the wise woman, uh, you know, who's gone through all these experiences and have now kind of come to the point where she's thought, well, you know, this is my home now and, you know, I'm here, I'm settled. But at the time I made this work, I, I felt uh, quite uneasy. So I put that figure in armor and about a year, 18 months after I made this work, uh, the Windrush scandal broke. So it was very timely. Um, and it speaks a lot to what's happening now. All rights movement. Um, so yes, who, who knew? Mm -hmm. And uh, the figure on the right, um, I, as a kid, was a real Star Trek fan, a bit of a nerd, and I, I've always asked big questions about the universe and how it works and our place in it. And I started this drawing basically as a response to another drawing. So it's actually, I imagined that it was going to be something completely different. But I had drawn this figure with these strange hand gestures and I didn't know what to do with with the hand gestures and I woke up one morning and I thought I'm going to put a cat's cradle on it and once I did that and painted a black dress I realized that I was talking about how I see the universe unfold mm -hmm. this kind of endless kind of um, uh, repetition and um, I thought that it's quite an elegant way of describing the universe unfolding by this cat's cradle but it also connects to memory memory um, personal memory like a childhood memory but also when you look up into the night sky we're looking back into history we're not actually seeing the sky as it exists today we're looking into the past so you know it kind of functions on both of those levels yeah Wow, and then also <laughs> I sort of feel that idea as well of the 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 kind of the strings being so taut, but at any yeah. moment you collapse and that fragility that feels very like now what what's safe, what's security, what's 
you know, it's going to collapse underneath us almost at the same yes. time. <laughs> yeah, that's right, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's a very, um, yeah, it feels very of the, mo of the moment in that sense of those other elements too. And what you're saying about, you know, you're looking at the sky, but you're looking at the past. Mm. Part of, becomes quite poignant with, with the other works in the show too. You know, sort of like yes. When you could, it's almost as well like a um, a glass ball, as if she's looking into the future. That sort of feeling of of that um, in the mm. you know looking at the, looking at the past. Yes, because that that tension is almost the tension that we're all feeling now because we're wondering, uh, you know, is this the new normal? Having to wear masks all the time and. Um, you know, there is that element of the unknown as well. Things are unfolding, but we just don't know where we're being led. And that that is um, interesting as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> will you be um, making works that will be about this sort of period of time now? Um, I, well, I, I've recently been in a show... Um, uh, which has been very cosmological. It's kind of continued on the cosmological theme. And in a way, it's my response. Uh, it's not an obvious response to what's going on now, but I feel that uh, the period that we're in is, um, for me and many people that I know, has been a time of reflection. And I wanted to kind of... Um, do something that was a little bit more cosmological, a bit more spiritual, do I, dare I say? Because I know it's not always a, a word that's kind of popular in the art world, but for me, I thought it was important to kind of go inward and reflect and also kind of look at ancient knowledge because for me, um, there is something about the notion of, um, ancient knowledge that somehow because there was more of a connection to the universe and to nature there are things that we used to know back in the past that we don't actually know now that we have to relearn in order to take ourselves forward you know it's that kind of um a wider connection because when i look at ancient cultures um a time before the colonial con construct, there seems to have been more of um, a, a kind of connected belief system, a, a kind of connected way of seeing ourselves in relation to the universe and our environment. There seems to be this common thread that mm -hmm. runs through all cultures. And I'm interested in that. I'm interested in um, the specifics of, um, say, African and Caribbean heritage and belief systems, but I'm also interested in the belief systems that um, are ancient, that connect us all together. So it's, it's quite interesting, those kind of dual things. And those are the kind of things I'm quite excited about exploring a bit more of. Mm, I look forward mm. to it. Will come <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, we'll move on to another kind of ritual <laughs> that connects us all, birthday parties. Um, this is a, a painting by Will Harmon. Um, and although his work is usually quite humorous, as you can probably tell or see or read, um, particularly during lockdown when, you know, kids had to be separated and not having birthday parties, it, it feels like it's hitting upon a different sort of visual diary of times um, gone past and the joy of these little celebrations um, being so limited um, and nerve making. <laughs> and although we're now allowed out and well, at least there's only six of them, right? In that painting, there's a rule of six. <laughs> well done, Will. <laughs> Very prophetic. Um, but you're sort of wondering about what impacts this will have on generations of you know, children that have missed out on schooling and how they've had to be quite resilient in that way. Um, so, uh, that, and there's a, just a little install shot of it on um, 
Collier Bristow Gallery wall there, um, which equally the memories of childhood um, we hit upon as we walk around the gallery on this virtual tour, uh, Margarita's um, piece, which is again, a sort of a character from a ch child's TV series, but it's a particularly, um, this, the creature Cheberushka is, um, uh, was basically a refugee or, an, yeah, uh, he was packed in a, in a box um, of, I think it was fruit. And, um, and uh, he was then, when he got to, I think it was America, but um, rejected by the zoo because he wasn't an, an known animal. Um, and he had to serve as a window display for a shop selling factory seconds. Um, so he was displaced too. Uh, he's a very famous character and actually it's been sort of taken, uh, taken under the wing of sort of China and like taking on that kind of characteristic. But I thought the idea of displacement and dislocation and his sad fate to be also um, particularly you know, um, relevant now in terms of refugees trying so desperately to get here before Brexit and uh, the lives that are sort of struggling through there. Um, but on a slightly brighter note, we have Laura Hudson's roller skates, um, which is a really uh, one of several pieces Laura has in the show. Um, so, um, but there's a great story behind it um, about your grandma's roller skates. Laura, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. <laughs> unmute yeah i think i've unmuted yeah am i there um it's quite a small painting this one and it's what you might call a breakout painting it came from a larger piece called catch 22 um where i was intuitively painting um this character this kind of totally amalgamation of a character and i put little wheels on the feet and it just reminded me of um my grandmother when um, in the 70s, we, we used to go and stay with our grandmother in the summer while my mum was working. And she was just this huge character. Um, her house was really spartan. She was just uncomplicated northerner with huge hands, huge feet. Nothing was frivolous. Nothing was nothing that was unnecessary in her house at all. She used to, she used to wash the packets of bacon and things. You know, she was just complete northern stoic. Anyway, this one summer she bought some roller skates with uh, embassy coupons and they were adjustable so that it would fit all three of us. But um, she just got a spanner out and opened them up, stuck them on her massive nine, size nine feet. And um, we pulled her up and she just skated off like this incredible, she, was, she must have been 70 at the time, like big lady with skinny legs and massive feet. And she just was just she became like a teenager she just was skating back and forwards gliding around i don't remember myself ever roller skating i just remember viscerally um the sensation of her skating and i just loved that um that trans that transformation that happened just by putting wheels on her feet mm -hmm. so, yeah so that's that's how come that painting <laughs> just as simple as it is because it's just that that memory of that joyous kind of transformation yeah definitely definitely you can get that all from that painting it's sort of full of a, a joy and freedom again something that's uh, we don't have so much of these days at the moment but um again um the opposite um laura's piece is um kate murdoch's platform um piece which also relates to grandmothers um this piece by Kate um, is called Objectification. Um, and there are a couple of videos on our Instagram um, that you can kind of fully see. So I've got a few images to try and um, uh, depict what the platform area is. Um, in, in the gallery, um, I commission works for this space and um, it means that the artist can um, obviously uh, create something very specific and very special and, and Kate had been thinking about this work which is about the, the passages of womanhood really um, and so it goes from girl to sort of woman to grandmother uh, towards the end of the uh, the platform um, and Kate's work is very much concentrating on sort of the the of objects but also um, how they sort of connect us to our sense of selves but also our identity 
um, our backgrounds, our culture. Um, and, you know, there's a, on the uh, dresser there, there's um, a group of figurines um, who have their mouths taped um, with some plaster. Um, so there were loads of interesting and intriguing sort of details and objects about how we meant to be as women when we're no longer seen as feminine as well as, as we age um, terribly. Um, but this idea of value and worth and so um, about where we come from and it being very particular as well to part of her own identity as well as the wider identity really. Um, yeah, so, and Kate has an, a, a really fascinating way of working with objects and the way that she recontextualizes them by putting them together and the relationships then go on um, with, with those connections, you know, this perfect, perfect uh, Barbie dolls and princesses and, uh, and so on. Um, and she's written quite a lot about it. She's a really uh, fa fantastic blogger on artist newsletter. So if you want to read more about even more about the internal processes of her selecting work um, and how she, she, she played with these ideas really, you know, on the day of um, installation, there's just one day. So she had to put together a lot of this, these ideas beforehand. And then, you know, it's, it's kind of really fascinating to watch people working on installations like this because it will be tiny tweaks and you know um her partner pete came was a really good set of second eyes and we talked a lot about it and t tiny things you wouldn't you know so it might in my look so perfectly placed which it is but it was just tiny adjustments all the time to make sure that there was just a right amount of space or color or so on um in, in the uh, installation um, and in that window that we saw up here, window, mirror rather, is Wendy's other piece that we have in the show, um, as you can see here. Um, so I'm just going to bring on Paula to talk a little bit about Wendy, who sadly isn't with us. So part of uh, the, the work was perfect for the show, but also um, it's incredibly important to kind of keep the legacy of what she was achieving and doing in her artistic career um, very much alive. Um, as she'd also been in a show at Collie Bristow Gallery with me before, and um, as has Paula. So, um, Paula, if you're there still. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. yes, I'm here. <laughs> Great. So, yes, I just uh, um, sort of went over to my bookshelf to find this, actually. I don't know if you can you see that? Oh, um, yeah. Thanks. Okay, my duck. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is a this is a close up of one of these figurines um, of Kate's, um, and I have to say, I, I it was just a kind of fantastic to have the the Wendy's work reflected in the mirror that's um, in, in Kate's piece. Um, this postcard. Um, was from a show called Disturbance, which Wendy and I, I think it m probably wasn't the first show we curated together, um, but it was, um, the, the, I think the first time we'd sort of carefully selected artists. Um, and uh, in fact, this was because of this show, um, I, it, it, that's how I met Kate as well. And we've been good friends ever since. Um, but yeah, this postcard was also, I found it on, uh, you know, as artists, we all have postcards on our, our wall or images of other artists that we admire. This was on uh, Wendy's studio wall when we cleared it out after she died. So this is a really beautiful connection for me. Um, and uh, yeah, so I thought I'd just, you know, share that with you, first of all. Um, mm. Um, uh, I, my original plan <laughs> was to read out her statement, which is on her website. So you'll hear her words about her work. Um, and then perhaps I'll talk a little about my perception of her work and some of the conversations we used to have. Um, so, although it's in the third person, these are her words. Um, Saunders' paintings are predominantly series of abstracted heads, experimenting in and exploring formal aspects of painting. 
Her latest series seeks out abstraction, partially stripping back figures to the underlying shapes. The paintings are a contra contrasting mix of strong forms and understated figuration. And she says, I have been constructing these new painting supports specifically to act as carriers for a number of ideas relating to the reading of human countenance and emotion. I make the stretches to represent a head shape. They are an evolved abstracted representation of the human form, but are they portraits? Using a combination of surface and materials, I then attempt to evoke visual ideas of character, states of emotion, or some form of human expression. Sometimes they work well and activate a psychological reading merely with the addition of colored paint, which taps into our memory or acts as a trigger about a person or people more generally. I experiment with ways that the materials can be used to drive these anthropomorphic anthropomorphic representations and where that can go in terms of representing either a state of mind, some form of behavior or ideas about the human condition. Um, so um, Wendy had uh, I met Wendy in 2012 on an artist residency and in fact I think that's when I first met you Rosalind as well. Uh, you were one of the guest speakers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, and uh, yes, I have to say we didn't quite hit it off at first, <laughs> um, but soon we kind of, you know, we formed a, a, a very good um, friendship and a very good working relationship. Um, and although um, she'd sort of come to making painting relatively late in life um she was um you know she didn't hang around she she was sort of um working really hard and making up for uh what she saw as lost time um, um we curated several shows together um and i think over time our we learned a lot from each other um uh, she started off just um, using um, essentially black paint and was drawing quite um, realistic portraits from photographs. Um, I was using really bright colours and over time her work became more colourful. Uh, there's one, a couple of pieces that are actually fluorescent um, paint. Um, and uh, my work has maybe, at times at least, become a bit more subdued. Um, and there are lots of kind of overlaps that I can see between our, our work. So it's kind of interesting to look back on that and see how kind of um, the effect of that relationship has had on both of us. Um, but yes, I... Uh, Wendy was disagreed, but I always saw these works as self-portraits. And I think, uh, you know, I'm kind of a strong believer that most artists are making some kind of <clears throat> self-portrait. Um, and she always disagreed. Um, she didn't like to think of them, um, excuse me, as portraits at all. Um, <clears throat> and they became as you can see in these increasingly abstracted um, and the, the you know the the color in this particular piece is taken from um, makeup from foundation and was made um, at City and Guild's um, art school um, where Laura was also a student. So I don't know if Laura, you want to chip in as well and say something about Wendy's work. Um, but uh, I, I had always said, you don't need to do uh, an MA, Wendy, but she felt like she really wanted to do this. She got a place and was so excited to be, um, you know, starting on this course. And she, she uh, did a, did a year and 
her work was suddenly transformed and through um, conversations with people like I think Kira Bennett, I think, and uh, uh, Teresita, I can't, Laura, what's Teresita's surname? Oh, I've forgotten the surname. I can't remember her surname. And yes. also Reese. Reese. Uh, Reese yes. Jones, is it? Reese, Reese Jones. Kira Bennett and Teresita. Anyway, <laughs> it might come to me in a minute. But yeah, her work suddenly kind of took off and there was this explosion of, you know, a lot of these small um, kind of abstracted heads with different uh, um, kind of surfaces. And she really started to um, explore materials. Um, she'd always been, um, I have to say, a little bit of a snob about the materials she used. Um, she was a huge fan of... Um, John Jones, she lived just around the corner from John Jones and knew the family quite well. Um, so I'm sure she'd be s very sad to know that they've um, closed now. Um, but yes, the interest in materials, she was looking like, at artists like Otis Jones, who she found hugely excited. Um, and I remember she was delighted actually when on Instagram, Otis Jones, uh, liked one of her pieces that was a, that was a, a huge kind of triumph for her so um yeah and another you know another um she'd been in a previous exhibition at collier bristow um i think was it strange lands rosalind um and uh that she felt that was a huge um achievement and she was really proud to be part of that exhibition. So I'm sure she'd feel um, delighted to be part of this show as well with such a great bunch of artists. So thank you, Rosalind. No, you're really welcome. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to have her works. And yeah, uh, there is a video talking about that show, Strange Lands, and how much it meant to her. So um, really pleased to have been able to show some more of her work as it evolved so much over the sort of two years and it was so exciting to sort of, it is so exciting to watch artists evolve um, in, in the ways that they do. Um, could, I, could I just chip in about Wendy's work there? Yes, do, yeah. Um, it, there was something that she said when we were at college together, because that, that's where I met her, and she was just the most incredible presence on the course. And she one day she said to me that she was a minimalist and that I was a maximalist because <laughs> I, I was always chucking everything in the, like trying to tell all the story in one go. And um, it, it really struck me so strongly because I, I felt that she was a maximalist in life, as in she just put everything in and, and just went for everything and sort of looked completely present while her work was more and more reduced to a, a very clean minimalist representation but her her herself as a as a person was such a maximalist i just thought that was a lovely contradiction mm. yeah and but also in terms of the curating it's sort of a, she's opposite almost like not the case of maximalist but there is a lot of information going on there but i loved the way that they speak to each other because of the girlish pink of the, the sort of triptych you know and it feels they feel very um they really speak to me, you know, of people, of presence, of expression, as I say, but without an expression. And it's really interesting that they have that power um, to evoke that much in people, um, yeah, in their minimalist way. <laughs> yeah, thank you both. Um, I will continue to move around the gallery. Um, so going uh, more into the themes of motherhood again, and. Uh, Aya Haida, um, there's a little shot here, which I just have to minimise you all actually, um, <laughs> so you can see. Um, yeah, so these are how they were positioned in the gallery, um, just to have some install shots whilst you do, whilst you're seeing it. It certainly helps that this is how I want you to view it. Um, but Aya's piece um, on the left hand side um, was about um, these seven items and the invisible labors attached to motherhood. Uh, it's called Highly Strong. Um, so it's about the 
Uh, it's been pulled from a series of 365 individually embroidered pieces, each one representing an act of invisible labour carried out for each day of the year. And it's about domesticity, labour and motherhood um, and a, being a full time mother and and an artist. Um, but also, there's sort of intertwining with feminism, with the embroidery um, and her being at the centre of the work. Um, so there's things like pumped and yeah, so she brought a selection of these um, pieces of clothing that she, she you know, um, been working on um, and, and made up this installation here. And then we won't go quite on to the piece on the right because we then skip back in terms of your viewing to, um, well, to Marion, Michelle and Laura Hudson again, but um, there's a lot of interplay within the, within the actual show that you can't see, but going between these ideas of youth and labour. And next to uh, Aya is Mara Michelle's piece. Um, it's called, um, oh, that's my make one. Um, yeah, it's, I think that when I'm sleeping, I must, must most perfectly resemble them. So these are also about childhood and that labour. The, the piece on the left of Marion's is, um, is all hand crocheted. And her work is very much about the bodily and also about familial relationships and the anxieties around the body uh, and the physical experience. So they're more moods and at atmospheres. So there's elements of myth and fairy tale. I mean, when I saw the piece, I sort of thought about three siblings um, sort of laying upon one another somehow with this sort of dissension and the shapes and the forms going down. And that's what I, I thought of siblings and about those relationships and how you're tangled in to each other's narratives too. Um, and thinking about sort of the idea of this, this uh, connectivity, I suppose, which is really, really important. Um, and then interestingly with, uh, we then go on to Laura's piece, which is again, very much about the bodily and endurance and anxiety and also childhood, because it's another memory for Laura. Um, in terms of that but also as you'll all see very very of the time <laughs> which is um it was called the piece is called what we're most afraid of has already happened uh it seems very prophetic now laura i mean i don't know what you think um well yes i think i think there's a connection also with charmaine here because um the process that i used to work <laughs> Oh, yeah. That's my phone. Um, they arrived at through doodling in a way where I'm completely, out, I'm not in control of what images arrive. So they tap into things I don't necessarily know. So that's how they kind of connect with Charmaine in the way that I'm really interested in anamnesis, which is recovering or re rediscovering knowledge that you already have. Um, and this, I guess that's why this painting ended up being called why what we are most afraid of has already happened um, because there's a for me there's a history of um, hostility towards lesbian and gay um, by transsexual people um, and surveillance and uh, all the all these sort of things and the, the kind of masking is a political um, thing and the helmet also because I'm uh, on the autistic spectrum, I find uh, noise pollution just horrendous. So the, the helmets and masking are often to do, I think with that for me personally, the, to do with shutting out the, the noise. So uh -huh. it's, it's a, I mean, that, that painting just arrived out of weird things and all, all the elements are to do with um, protections of some kind, whether it's the, the float band or the fingers crossed or the, the helmet. But there is a, somebody actually said to me that my paint is now looking at them, they feel very future splaining. Yeah. It almost feels like um, my subject has kind of disappeared because all these things that have been huge sources of anxiety for me have, have actually happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we all need some armbands at this point in time um, yeah. to get us through what may or may not be the next phase of the um, but Thank you, we'll carry on um, over to Sikalila Owens' uh, portraits. Again, the narrative of childhood is here, 
um, and Nathan Eastwood on the right. And again, actually, well, Laura, what you were saying also relates to anxiety, surveillance, introspection with sort of Nathan's piece on the right hand side. And these two depictions of youth of a very different aspect, you know. Um, so these were sat next to each other in the in the exhibition. Um, and for me, sort of looking at two very different scenarios of childhood and what that might mean and where it might be. And when I was thinking about me, myself and I in the first stages when I was like emailing the artists and stuff, um, somebody was saying, or even I telling people that people would say, so what's the next show? What's it about? I was saying it's called Me, Myself and I. Um, and somebody said, oh, is, that, is it a show about narcissism and selfies? And I was like, no, not at all. <laughs> no, that's the last kind of show I'd curate. Um, but which, and I'd been thinking about Sikh Lula's work in terms of these very tender portraits, also of a time before we were, where the world had not become so selfie obsessed and you know, taking the perfect photograph, we used to take millions, we did, used to take millions of photos um, and occasionally some of them would turn out right and they'd be quite natural and spontaneous. And um, so I've been thinking about Sikh Lula's uh, work here, um, Massey and Paloma, um, these sort of quiet moments and they're from um, Sikh Lula's family photos, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Not in, yes. Yeah. Do you want to unmute yourself? Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I thought you were talking to us. Yeah, I was nodding. Uh, yeah, they're, 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 yeah they're, they're my family. Um, and actually, they are fully grown women now. They're in their 40s, coming on, coming on a bit longer. But I think, um, like, ideas of memory and, and like, I think there's something about, like, um, yeah, I think basically what happened, I'd lost a number of people earlier on in the year. So I think I was thinking about like how much you don't know about those you love. Yeah. <laughs> um, and maybe like it sort of it made me look at older photos and kind of try and come try to think about like who these people are to me and who these people were. And like, yeah, so I, I really have an interest in kind of these moments that, you know, you take for granted, you look at images, and um, yeah, they're very, both very uh, accomplished women. And um, yeah, and just looking back at them, I just wanted to look back at them and these moments, especially because I think it's very, like these particular images were quite a contrast to what I see them as now. And, you know, sort of childhood awkwardness, legs crossed um, and just, yeah. And seemed very, like when stripped back, you were just focusing on the figure and the image and them as individuals um, and yeah so I, that was kind of the reason um, that I look at that I was looking at them and um, I tend to look very much at like micro things and ideas of intimacy and empathy and I think there's something yeah definitely now I think empathy is a good thing to have and to be able to look at what someone is and realize that for most people obviously one begins vulnerably and um, yeah, and what, you know, we all begin, well, not we all begin, but we often begin in similar places. <laughs> and there are lots of things that we work through um, and then we come to these spaces. And I think um, for me, I come from a very large family. So, um, you know, this was actually when they, when they were in Zimbabwe with my grandma, who I lived with for a year. So, you know, there's more formal photograph taking and they were basically just taken before they immigrated to London and America respectively. And um, I suppose it's kind of that, like that last photo and, um, and these sort of figures who you consider part of your lives and part of your communities, even though they're not right on your doorstep. So definitely like, um, yeah, and I'm in Zimbabwe I had a not a coup recently, so I think <laughs> lots of those kind of thoughts, this sort of idea of like um, just the um, ideas of community and how, you know, they're not necessarily, the people you're close to are not necessarily close by sometimes. Um, so yeah, so, and also just, I'm always interested in trying to figure out what other people are thinking and um, mining that. And I suppose that's why they kind of feel very introspective sometimes because trying to understand the figure, the subjects in it. That's how it goes, yeah. Mm, wonderful.
yeah or just and bring a, a certain sense of joy i think it as at the same time of, of remembering our own moments of that in childhood you know of the, the dressing and having to present yourself and you know awkward photos as well <laughs> Well, yeah, actually, yeah, because prior to this, I was doing um, of my nieces who are, you know, I just realised that, like, the similarities, I mean, the repetitions, isn't it? The repetitions of these, you know, like you said, getting your Sunday best on and taking your photo. Um, yeah, and I like my nieces who are in Sheffield, <laughs> and they, like, always love, like, they're performers, and they have to dress up and things, and um, just, yeah, so I, so I kind of, just that whole, there's an occasion but it's not a massive occasion. And I think that um, there's something about quiet, not quite occasions that is like the lifeblood of my work. I like those moments, which are very easy to pass over in a photo album. And yeah. Yeah, those quiet moments. Yeah. yeah. Which takes us neatly on to um, the, these pieces too. Um, another piece by Laura, again, uh, an expression of where we are now in our hazmat suits. But this sort of quiet, there was a relationship as well in terms of these were sort of adjacent to one another in the gallery. And um, that solitude that Steve Leela was saying, you know, is very much present in the piece by Nathan on the right hand side. Um, of those, yeah, those moments that are maybe uneventful, but profound at the same time, um, perhaps, or maybe not. Maybe it's totally just being absorbed in the rhythm of a washing machine in, in Nathan's piece. But um, yeah, there's quite a few of these uh, drawings by Laura. They're sort of a series, aren't they? I can see he's on the, above your door in your studio. <laughs> the one that's, or is it, it might be another version of one. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it again feels very oddly prophetic um, to see that um, that drawing at this particular time and protection and thinking it, about protection of that baby in that suit. Um, can you see the dark? Can you see the dark thing up in the top yeah. corner? Yeah, that's actually a real hazmat suit. These drawings came out of some deep memory. I didn't know I'd seen them. They were issued by the government to babies under two years old. Yeah. You're supposed to put the baby in in case of a nuclear attack or gas bomb. And yeah. I actually found one after I'd drawn these. So I've actually got one in my studio now. So it's good to be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> they, they couldn't protect you in a month of Sundays. They're just they're open flaps of canvas. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, that is a very interesting oxymoron, isn't it, really? Um, very much of the time of having very little protection when we most needed it or when our you know hospital staff or care homes needed it so again who who would who would have thought about that back in when i was talking to you all in november and december about the show um yeah very they've become, do you laura do you feel like they've taken a new political element now as well it, i know they're that was in your mind at the same time of the sort of politics of the hazmat suit and things like that but it was always my intention it's um i th think particularly with the, those suits they had uh concertinas in the arm that the mother was supposed to um press the press to get air into the suits but they were made of heavy heavy rubber that was you had to be very strong to actually press the concertina and i i remember seeing a second world war film really long long time ago um, where the father comes home from work and the mother's sitting at the table crying because she can't she doesn't have the strength to press the bellows and it just it just made me think how um, horrendous that the that governments and um, around the world are sort of bombing and creating sort of weapons of mass destruction and and the the onus or the responsibility of safety gets put on to women who have got no involvement in making those um, destructive courses of action or materials. Mm. I just find it quite um, horrendous. Yeah. So they, they've always had that uh, intention in, from me, but I, I don't know how other people see them now. I, I, I don't know. Mm. Well, they just, like everyone's, for me, it really works on so many levels now as it did before if you see what i mean so 
what's that added element really? Um, yeah, which takes us neatly on to uh, Connor Rogers' piece also about which and uh, things that, well, um, haven't been um, part of daily life for a while. Anyway, these are absolutely tiny, 15 by 10 centimetres, each of these betting slips on actual uh, betting slips. <laughs> these are the real thing. Um, so they're sort of these tiny jewels and about uh, Connor's identity and growing up uh, in what the betting office to him was like a, his holy place and making a pilgrimage there with his um, granddad every weekend and, and those deeper connections. Um, so yeah, it's all painted. Uh, you can marvel <laughs> at that intricacy. And Connor was here. He was also painting. I don't know if you're still here, Connor, because I can't see the whole gallery of people. Otherwise, it will obliterate my. Can you uh, see me now? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, hey. hi. Um, yeah. So, the, tell us a little bit about you know all the, the these pieces, and they contain so many sort of stories, don't they, and hopes and desires of that. I'll maybe win the next one and obviously then being around people that do win and don't win and that environment really. Yeah, yeah, the the work's very symbolic. Personal symbolism is important in my work. When I generally see objects or see the mysticism of how we live our lives, lived experience especially. So um, it's a social commentary in a way. Um, these pieces came in, in direct response actually to a memory of painting, uh, not painting, of drawing on backs of beer mats in pubs when I was about five or six mm -hmm. and then obviously through experience and going into these places and these spaces and the people that occupy them and the sort of continuous rituals as you mentioned that I experienced as a kid which sort of embedded into me or ingrained into who I was um, led to me to think of how I could incorporate all that sort of idea of who I was and what these places and the people occupied and what they represented to me uh, and how I could sort of figure out my sense of self through that um, led me, led to me to actually go actually these objects could hold a nice paint and the framework of it and the sort of the correspondence between image and objects and the symbolism between the two and what they represented was really important so um, it's quite an easy process and a really enjoyable um, series of paintings, which is still ongoing. I'm still making, there's probably about, there's three depicted here, but I've got about seven or eight betting slips and I'm hoping to have a show later on in 2021, um, which is sort of expanding on the idea of what the betting, betting office represents and the call to that um, used to visit these spaces uh, represented to me so yeah I mean really enjoyable work what I think would be good actually it might be a bit random is if I read you a poem because I've started doing poetry off the back of uh, paintings and I use them to correspond together so mm -hmm. I've wrote a poem about these pieces uh, and you'll get it because it's hard to unravel what's in my head and mm -hmm. sometimes there's always so there's limitations to how we can sort of convey ourselves and that's why my language of painting does it quite in a literal form but then there's also the concepts behind it, which sometimes people aren't really understanding or there's, there's certain areas of what I, why I'm doing it, which people never really understand or see. So I think if you let me put, read a poem now, do you mind me doing that? Yeah, please, go ahead. No. All right, let, let me do it. Because it's, so the poem's about the, the betting slip and the betting office and the, the painting itself, but also what it, the reasoning behind why I made it are able to expand a bit more in the form of poetry, which I've sort of started doing with recent. So I'm going to hold the phone. So if you see my uh, rolls of chins, don't laugh at me. One second. Okay, so the poem's called What Are the Odds? Is it a memory or a dream? The social kids and their queens, dancing turns and boozy binges for families with doors without injures. Your fleeting love on Saturday mornings, Cash out of your impulses. They will drive your engine to the ground. It's a mutual habit of losing a pound. Now Dead Eye's got a 10 pence, six cents. SES Dave was once a gold medal winner. A commendation for being a sinner. A Malky's grim gargle. A consistent routine of cleansing his palate. It smelt like cockles and John Smith's. He always landed his round robin though. To some, his life was full of, full of disdain. A contradiction came from fags in the rain. And Alan finally wedged it in. 
and the coin for the bandit and the bravado. He came from a land of the brave. These places are us. These places are we. These places set free. These places are the faces of time and different spaces. The ritual begins. Bedrooms to the bookies. Bookies to the boozers. Boozers to the bedrooms. Is it repetition or life cycle? The circle of life for people who sharpen their knife. The holy place. Only these pilgrims seek God's mighty golden hall. Must be robbing Peter to pay Paul. So summon up your spirits. The barman must be a shaman. He's casting voodoo curses and making magic potions. His pill pipes has them speaking in tongues and walking funny. Then back to the bookies to throw away more money. Now you chew back a cry when you wave your hacker goodbye. So loosen up your tie. The butcher has brought you another pork pie. So what are the odds of uncovering that they aren't horrible sods? Now what are the odds? Taste of victory to replace time's endless dichotomy. Now what are the odds of letting go and stepping forth? Now, what are the odds of loving all that we stand for? That's the one. Wow, thank you so much. Sweet. Yeah, just dabbling in a bit of poetry at the moment and yeah. really quite free freeing now, actually, because since being like since the show, I've managed to sort of get things down in text and expand on my ideas a lot more. And and they're working together a lot more, sort of poetry and spoken word and, and the actual painting. So I started to realise my practice isn't necessarily just about uh, painting. It's about an idea or language and storytelling. And that can be expanded or translated into many different forms, which I'm really enjoying doing new things and sort of taking some risks. Yeah, no, it's Thanks, great. Thanks, Lynette. It's great to have those accompanying one another because they do really, really work. Um, and mm. you can see a lot more of uh, Connor doing some poetry on his Instagram. Um, which I highly recommend. Um, if you, anyone watching this does want to connect with any of the artists here today, you will find them on our Instagram. So you can follow them and have conversations of your own. Um, thank you so much, Connor. I wasn't expecting to have live poetry, so that's added well, both. That's it. You got <laughs> VIP treatment. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. <laughs> we'll carry on um, with a uh, piece that's right near to corners which will get the idea of them placed together if i'm not there which is the title of this piece by erica winston um sums up in associations and contexts in terms of maybe that absence of when somebody is in the thralls of you know a betting shop or and the accompanying things that sort of connor describes really of the, that kind of traction um of experience and, and, um, and memories too. Um, so this is Erica Winston's, um, it's a very built up surface um, and Erica often collaborates with her daughter in her work. And this is based on um, a Bob Dylan sort of film that also was part of the performance. So Erica, like Connor, works between performance and video and painting. Um, so Erica, I don't know if you'd like to say a few words. Uh, I know you were there before in the gallery. You were. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and it was great coming after Connor because um, my mother describes my grandfather um, as having been a professional gambler. So uh, that was a nice little link. Mm. I guess, um, yeah, I, I work, uh, I've worked for a long time with my daughter, who's now 24 and a performer um, herself. Um, I, I, in this piece, um, the way she was involved is that I filmed her. Um, I, I showed her um, a little bit of a documentary about Dylan. Uh, and it's a scene where he is reading and sort of ad-libbing and making a sort of um, a poem up on the spot as he reads off a pet shop wall. And he's really playing with the words and what they mean and the order of them. And I found the same spot in London uh, where he was filmed doing this. And I showed Anna the film and took her there and asked her to do what she remembered him doing. Mm -hmm. And I then uh, worked from that footage of both the real Dylan and my daughter um, and fused those performances together. 
Um, and the, the letters forms that you can see are the names of some of the films that I've drawn the painting from. And one of them is Charlie Chaplin's The Kid, which is why you can see a faint thing of kid. Um, and I was also, uh, which is also working um, where Charlie Chaplin worked with this young, young child actor. And it was very much about the relationship of an uh, uh, orphan who he takes in as a, as a tramp um, and the relationship that develops between them. And I guess, I, I'm very interested in, in relationships, positive relationships between adults and children. And also, I suppose, about the child in the adult as well. And um, I love the way in the, this performance of Dylan that he becomes very childlike as he's, as he's doing the rhyme. And I, I work by looking at these films and mixing them together hundreds of times and drawing from them and sort of combining, working from the film moving and pausing it. And I have actually painted the titles underneath so that people could sort of unpick the sources uh, if they want to. And, um, and then there's other bits of writing that are coming from the dialogue that's being said or the songs that are being sung uh, which for me are all part of uh, what I'm interested in. And there are little figures which you, you sort of need to be probably in front of it uh, to see. It's a little bit difficult to see, um, but they, um, I suppose it's very much uh, about the fragility of the relationships that we form and, the, um, and trying to sort of capture them, trying to sort of hold on to them in some way. Mm. Um, and very much, I guess, about sort of the value and importance of communication across different generations, which is why it's been great to be in a show like this one. Um, uh, yeah. And the value of the attempt, I suppose, that even though it may seem ridiculous sometimes to um, perform if you're not a performer, um, you know, to actually, for me to start to take part in my own films and put myself in front of the camera, which is what I've been doing a lot more lately, feels acutely embarrassing. Um, but yet at the same time, I think there's a real value to it for me and maybe to put myself in that position as well to feel what it's like and to learn from it and to work with the unexpected and to sort of try and identify and the and also because I do a lot of this sort of revisiting and finding the actual place where the original filming happened but returning there sometimes 30 years later and seeing what's changed and also seeing what's still the same mm -hmm. and I guess these are some of the things that I'm really interested in 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 the work. Thank you very much us so much about it. Um, yeah, you do really need to experience them as well. This is not uh, quite as just justify justifying the original work, but um, yeah, the sort of excavations of it as well, like plumbing, also your own sort of memory and history and family relationships as well. Um, it's very uh, very physical in the piece itself as well. You know, bearing down on. on the past as well mm. <laughs> which takes us very neatly to uh, the painting that's right next to Erica's which is uh, Paraffin Man by Ken Kiff um, and next to that is Broughton Burney and the only reason it's small that painting next to it is to try and give you a sense of scale but actually the painting on the the right by Broughton Burney is actually very very small and coincidentally Ken Kiff taught uh, Kevin uh, Broughton um, who works in collaboration with Fiona Burney. Um, there are several pieces by Ken Kiff and it was one of the artists that, again, I have a long list of artists in my mind, but very much encapsulated the essence of me, myself and I, you know, you've got the three portraits going on here, um, like the id and the ego and the alter ego and everything like that. Um, and it's sharp and sitting next to Erica's sort of also the idea of absence as well. Um, so 
it's quite a despairing one. <laughs> um, and I was really lucky to um, to meet Anna Kiff, who's on the video call, um, through um, Graham Crowley. He wrote a really wonderful thing about Ken's work. Um, and we were very lucky to borrow these works from um, John Talbot, who has the most major and amazing collection of Ken Kiffs. Um, but it, it, yeah, as well, that really sings to this point in time. But um, Graham wrote, um, he painted in his work, a society in which harmony and understanding coexist with incomprehension and isolation. He painted about anxiety as his fractured sense of self and his place in the world. Simultaneously fantastic, delightful and disturbing, his paintings have both the emotional range and power which permits the paintings to simultaneously appear both joyful and oppressive. Harnessing the perpetual, involuntary and random maelstrom that is the inner voice, the internalised chatter, the running commentaries that occupy our quieter moments, the stories we tell ourselves. Um, it's a simultaneously delightful and perplexing mix of the Arcadian and dystopian has come to epitomise his work. Um, and they also have a, a wonderful presence um, in themselves, like Erica's and all the other works, you know, to actually physically stand in front of them and fall in love. And there's several pieces in the show and some are delightful and some are anguished. And it's sort of encapsulating that spectrum of emotions and feelings that we all have in our complex times. Um, and then uh, Broburn, um, they've got several uh, little works and the one next to them is the general. Um, and he's sort of a, a very different type of character, <laughs> uh, as you can tell by the name, but um, it's sort of inspired by Otto Dix's War Cripple paintings, uh, as it's called. Um, but this idea of the general face obscured by a sheet has no knowledge of where he is heading, yet continues to push forwards to his unknown cause, taking all with him. And if that reminds you of any leaders in the free world, <laughs> then you'd be right. <laughs> um, which then accompanied at the same time by that last sentence, we go on to around the gallery to this piece by Lynette Rabaya, um, which is an incredible um, portrait and it's called um, Untitled Eight. And when I spoke to Lynette about it, we talked about Untitled can often be sometimes a stand in for artists that can't think of a name, but it's very purposeful um, in Lynette's work. Uh, reminding us, the, the audience, of the inequalities and corrupt power that generals across the world are administering and not listening to voices. And so her work is often about referencing and highlighting the importance of Black Lives Matter, essentially, and that's not what it was called at the time, but of course that's the underlying purpose of the work that she's making and about stories experienced globally by Black African descendants. Um, and as a child of the African diaspora herself, you know, her search for home within that. And it's also, a, it's a memory portrait, but it also encapsulates an experience, but also the vulnerability, I think, which already was really powerful before all the horrors around the world of George Floyd and, and everything that's going on. Um, the inequalities that are being faced by people of BAME um, backgrounds. Um, is, is a super powerful thought um, and about representing the underrepresented. Uh, but yeah, and it's uh, it's quite small as well, which you'll see. Um, I've got a couple of install shots so you can see where we've come from and where we're going. Um, and you'll see the next part of another install shot. But yeah, and then right next to that is again, these other characters that are putting the sheets over their head. They're not looking, they're not listening. But at the same time, the sort of that the portrait that Lynette has is of a child and sort of thinking about child games and hide and seek. And um, I remember a story about um, a friend's child that would put the sheet over their head and say, think that they couldn't be seen. <laughs> but also that whole hide and seek of trying to get people to take responsibility for their actions, um, but people uh, facing away, which takes us appropriately to King Baby on the right hand side. <laughs> by Eleanor Morton, uh, an omnipotent, childish and narcissistic, a character from an alternative world, she says. But to be honest, we all know a few king babies that are present um, in positions of power across the world right now. Um, 
And with Eleanor's, it's often these meditations on morality, the psyche and possibility of evil, and also what happens when you get power and how that can be corrupting. So there are these political resonances, again, that word resonance, I'm gonna say it a lot of times today, <laughs> um, that are there. So there you can see the sort of sequence of how you would see them in the gallery. And also, you know, Lynette is then also looking out onto King Baby, you know, um, and that was a very purposeful thing um, of the placement of the works. Uh, as you go around, you then have this sort of the fairy tales uh, element starts to sort of come in more strongly uh, with this other piece by Ken Kiff and C. Leela. This is her niece that she spoke about earlier uh, in her ballet, ballet, ballerina dress, really dressing up. And um, it's just if there's a fairy tales always have that ominous edge <laughs> that Ken Kiff is. Um, but also uh, sort of enjoying the joy in Sikhlila's uh, niece and her sort of, again, unconsciousness um, of, of, yeah, of being a child when we have less of these anxieties, hopefully. Um, and in the gallery, we then um, move into rooms that are situated around the gallery uh, and we come to Marie Harnett, so carrying on with a sort of macabre fairy tale, I suppose. Uh, again, Marie Harnett's piece is probably about as big as what you can see on this screen, depending on how big your screen is. And it's just a drawing. Um, it's a tiny, tiny little drawing. Um, it's 8.2 by 15 centimeters, and it's called Wall. And for me, it looks a lot like a scene from Wizard of Oz, but it's actually a slightly darker story, isn't it, Marie? Yeah, it's, um, it's actually from a film called Crimson Peak, but, um, I've not seen it. I don't know. I, I work from film, but I don't tend to uh, watch the films that I'm drawing just because it's nice to um, not have their story. I'm using them uh, as a vehicle to explore something. But um, I wanted to layer a few images because uh, there's something about you can kind of see it a bit from a distance, but as a small one, you need to go up close and it can be, you can see this kind of fabric or something really nice about it then you pulled in and then you're like oh what's that and there's this kind of I think almost an unpleasantness about it or something a bit creepy and um yeah I kind of it's quite nice to explore that um especially in relation to memory I think we we very rarely remember things accurately or we have these little fragments and this felt a bit like that a bit like childhood and a bit like trying to recall something and you just get these kind of fragments. You never really remember, say, a whole day. It's all this kind of um, little pieces. And I kind of wanted to to play a bit with that, with, with this work, mm. I think. And um, yeah, the reason they're so small is because I want them to feel really intimate. So some of the drawings are like the size of a, a postage stamp. And then most of them about the size of a playing card. This one was, was a bit bigger, 15 centimeters. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's to get that that intimacy, and so you have a very personal relationship with it. You have you have to go up close to um, uh, to see it, and and to kind of hopefully get a bit of a, an emotional reaction with it. Mm. I hope so, at least anyway. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, there's a lot to see in it, and to keep looking at, and I think that's really important. Um, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, very exquisite. Um, just like a collection of dreams almost at the same time. And yeah, yeah, kind of the, the images dissolve into one another, which um, I kind of think it works as one image, but yeah, it's, that there are there are a few in play there. So it's kind of, you can kind of pick out and I guess choose which bits to focus on as well. And it's part of the reason I work with pencils because it's it's got fragility to it. Yeah. And that um, you kind of sense that, you know, that, you know, if you take an eraser, it's, it's gone and it's, it's very silvery as well, especially if you tilt it in a certain light, it, it gleams silver and that it adds this kind of jewel like and very fragile element to it, which, um, which is quite important to me. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, exquisite, as I say. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just aware of the time, so I'm going to kind of go a bit more rapidly through so that um, uh, a couple of people that are here on the, on the meeting can talk a little bit about their work, but we go into this room with Marie to more um, fables and stories um, by Eleanor and Margarita. Uh, 
this piece is actually a very huge piece uh, on that covers the entire wall. Um, so opposite Marie's actually, so kind of different dimensions for sure, um, and different stories as well. Um, I'm aware we have men on here because we spoke earlier. Uh, this was a, a set of uh, three works in the same room, this and there's another piece by Eleanor Morton. Um, oh gosh, how embarrassing. Uh, but yeah, this is one of uh, Manon's pieces from a series of works that she's been working on. This is Andrew. Um, and so this room that, that they were all situated in focuses more on the identity part of the show as well. So when you have the separate rooms in the gallery, it allows for you to draw upon the themes like we just saw with Marie and Margaritas. Uh, and this idea, I, I loved also the, the joining together of these three works that were about this, the decoration of the skin and the way that people use clothes or, or you know, indeed tattoos to be an identifier of many of their, their feelings or evocations of themselves. But yeah, maybe you could tell us a little bit, Manon. Sure. So this is a portrait of Andrew and it is part of um, a series called Altered that I've been working on for the last two to three years. And it's made up of uh, about 30 different portrait portraits of people who are physically altered. Um, and I started this project because I wanted to champion people who are often marginalized and seem to be other. Um, and throughout all my research, I couldn't find any portraits that really showed the beauty and um, gave an opportunity to people to rediscover themselves. And that's what really became quite clear early on in the project as I started capturing people's portraits was this therapeutic value of photography um, and how we could use that to um, redefine our new state of being, our new physical um, identity. Um, and what's really wonderful about this project is that everyone's been captured in the nude, their naked portraits. So there's no sort of, they're quite timeless, except for the fact that people have got tattoos, a lot of people have got tattoos and you can sort of, you know, put people in time and place because of that. But the, you know, there's no sort of, identity of their socio-economic status or anything like that is very homogenized and everybody is equal and um, yeah it's been a really wonderful project to work on and I'm grateful to be sharing it here with you guys. Yeah, I mean it's so evocative I mean yeah and I loved placing it with Georgina's piece as well um, and that you know, another sort of expression and um, the portrait on the right is of um, Hankin, oh, no, sorry, what was his name? I've just, um, oh, uh, Jenkin, sorry. <laughs> I don't know where that name came from. But Jenkin, he's a natural art student um, at the Royal Academy. This is his evoking his identity. This is how he lives and dresses in, in his everyday life and how we now, have those freedoms to be able to express ourselves in in so many different ways whether it's in the clothes we wear as i say the tattoos we have or in the artwork that we make that was also part of our own um showing of our own identities and interests and concerns a bit like um you know the portraits they're all sort of portraits of ourselves at the same time as being maybe portraits of other people too um and our passions and things that resonate again that word <laughs> tried to find some alternative in the thesaurus but it wasn't uh, <laughs> it wasn't anything that was quite as right um but i'll move on just to um make sure we get all the works thank you so much manon um and eleanor was also in that room and this is um uh, from janet and john and she's this girl is also descending into the underworld but again there was this decorative and also that balance of you know um steering into those places as well um uh, and again, to, to try and show you the different scales, we have uh, Broburn on the left-hand side. Um, and uh, this is The Alchemist. And then next to it is Will Harmon's of the pub. Again, uh, <laughs> we all need a drink. Um, <laughs> but um, this idea of this quite um, chaotic alchemist. And um, there's a lot going on with, with both pieces. And with Broburn's, there's lots of sort of stories within it. And, you know, there's people being carried away under tables. Uh, and particularly now, it feels very, um, yeah, again of our time, but um, the chaoticness, I suppose, that 
sort of in Summer Broburn, this book, and with Will is sort of depicting what, yeah, a, a, the visual twisted diary that Will has, and it's when he used to work in a Weatherspoons and the collection of people that were there, and the, maybe that sort of very, um, what, what feels quite strange because we haven't been around people. <laughs> Well, I haven't been, I don't know about you all, but um, or gone to a pub in a very long time, but um, this kind of collapsing of memories and characters um, together. Um, bygone ages, really. <laughs> and these are two more, which I think is maybe somebody being wheeled away um, from the pub in this piece on the left-hand side by Broburn. Um, but the idea of, um, it's called chairing this particular piece, but ludicrous political camp campaigns that have developed over the past couple of years and uh, the candidate is supported by his confused and bewildered entourage and being propelled forward with his collection of crazy ideas no plan no control just the de desire to get to the finishing post first um which again has a political element and sort of the uncertainty of the future and the uncertainty uncertainty of what we've all been living with um and on the right hand side is another piece by eleanor morton which is called dung beetle uh, which is a sort of Sisyphean um, quest of another type. Um, and basically this idea of the dung beetle is that it, it basically um, gets a ball and tries to roll it backwards over the dune and it keeps on falling over. It can't see what this beetle doesn't know what it's doing. And it can't see where it's going, but navigating by the stars, which takes us back to Charmaine's star lady at the beginning, um, the co cosmology, um, and feeling that very much epitomized also the artist journey, which can feel quite Sisyphean, uh, of being endless sort of uh, trying to go up a hill with a ball falling on your head all the time, <laughs> um, but trying to push forward anyway, and then also evocative of the wider experience of like we're trying to go somewhere without knowing where we're going. Um, and then there's another piece just, um, sorry, next to that um, by Eleanor, which is a, about um, Creek. And it's, again, these stories about, it's actually based on sort of a photograph of Charles Manson's um, about where do you go from the point of committing that sort of horrendous acts um, and how people were really enchanted by this story and, and by him. Um, but yeah, and it's also about precipices, I suppose, that um, in her work, um, which takes us to uh, Paul Benjamin's and Ken Kiff. So they were shown in this way. I'm just going to minimise the gallery. Um, so Paul Benjamin's is the two, paint, uh, two paintings on either side of the Ken Kiff. And um, this is about a personal struggle. Um, and it was... Um, so Paul... Um, died of cancer uh, uh, as well. And um, these were from his cancer diaries that he made whilst he was undergoing treatment um, up to the end of his life. Um, and Paul was, um, he was my mentor and he was my friend um, and was so hunting for the right moment to show the work because it's the cancer diaries. I've, there's seven sketch pads, I've seen them and cried over them. Um, and they're really poignant and they're perfect and they, they're that about this journey and um, this political sort of personal struggle um and then this sort of dahlias by ken kiff in the middle is sort of that transition piece of like a place of pathos of wanting to take care of the somebody the sun that's behind that kind of little guy creature there in the middle um seemed in incredibly poignant to me um and the there is a a book that we had at the gallery um and that is uh is for sale. His wife, Jackie uh, Benjamins, who helped me with um, getting the work, um, created a book out of some of, well, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of the uh, diaries. And um, yeah, that's on, on sale if you're interested um, and goes towards raising some money um, for, uh, for Macmillan. Um, so yes, uh, that was a very poignant part of the wall because as we'll, as I say this, we're coming to the end of the actual exhibition. Um, and we have Waiting Room by Laura Hudson here, which again paired with Paul's piece um, and with current um, waiting room scenarios, um, feels uh, incredibly articulate about this time. Um, and I'm gonna keep going so that we can have some questions at the end. Um, 
if, if people are still around, I realize it's one o'clock. Uh, so there's just two more pieces to show you. This, so this is the final room that I would take you to, um, going from the place of quite a sad place in a way, um, of waiting rooms and, and people that we all might have lost being in those places. Um, but yeah, thinking about um, these pieces are, of sort of companionship really. Um, even though on the left hand side, it does look very like a sad companionship. Um, but thinking about um, closeness and intimacy again, you know, the how much we maybe won't take for granted some of those simple things in life, um, the conversations with a neighbor um, that's in Nathan Eastwoods, but um, and needing to depend on people and, and also help people um, in this time. So the piece on the, on the left hand side is called Unlikely Angel. Um, and thinking about all of our unlikely angels that we've possibly all had over the last few months um, feels like a kind of really um, important way to end this part of the talk. So uh, I just want to thank all the artists um, for coming and contributing and everyone for joining. Um, obviously it was meant to finish at one, nothing's going to happen to the recording so we, you know if you want to stick around and ask a couple of questions the audience members um, I'm gonna, you can unmute yourselves and I will bring up the gallery <laughs> and uh, we can have a bit of a chat for, for 15, 20 minutes, whatever really. Um, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'll bring you all up and then uh, you can unmute. And what I would just suggest, because there's quite a few of us, is just maybe raise your hand so I can see you um, better. <laughs> and then we're not all talking over one another. Um, oh, Lynette joined us. I'm, didn't realize, I couldn't see once I started he was joining us. So um, yeah. So uh, does anyone have any questions? Just do the gallery view, I can see everyone. Oh, there you go. And you can all see one another sort of. Any Oh, David's here. Hi, David. So David also wrote a piece uh, for AN about the show. Was that helpful <laughs> after you've already written it? You had some lots of interesting points to raise. I don't know if you want to unmute yourself. I can unmute you, I think. I'm trying to unmute you. Maybe you can, oh, there you go. That's right. No, I, 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 I listened in just to see just to hear other people really um it's 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 good to know that you've touched on that i've touched on bits that uh, <laughs> were intended to be there uh, but it's interesting to hear people go through the way they make things and what they do with things but one of the things i'm sort of interested in too is is actually the look i mean it perhaps come across in what i wrote but but the look of things um mm. it's, it's like the aesthetics as well as the content um which is sort of harder to write about the uh the grandma's roller skates one which which is very puzzling and it, it may be an oversimplified question but i wonder sometimes why people paint the way they do and how their images come because i sorry I'll, I'll go on just a little bit more i i do i do think that particularly with myself, and I, I came across a, an artist called Richard Forster a while ago who paints very, he draws very, very detailed and laborious images um, in his little studio on his own. And it struck me that one of the things that we're doing is, is actually making a, an environment for us to survive in by doing these things. They kind of confirm who we are. Do you know what I mean? And that's, that's maybe the way why people do particular things but I'm, I'm beginning to <laughs> go around in circles now but i wanted to see what other people said about the stuff and to listen basically um, mm -hmm. which has been very good for me thank you <laughs> yeah we, um david wrote a review based on not actually seeing the show but having to look at my images and having conversations a little bit about the work and um, so masterfully done um, <laughs> you led the way in the first line review i think um, and trying to piece together my thinking and all of your works in a sort of Dropbox folder, essentially, which is yeah. together than it might look. 
Ananta, do you want to, uh, did you have anything that you want to say? Or Lynette, if you're still here, um, that's a, uh, I've got, I'm just having a look at the chat. <laughs> okay, good um, Yeah, did, did you want to say anything? Or, uh, my inspiration, of, what was my inspiration? Somebody's asked. Um, I just, I really felt it was, um, I did mention, but like me, myself, and I just felt very, relevant, I think, historically and politically of thinking about people's and identity. And I hadn't done a show about identity in that quite um, figurative way. This is sort of my most figurative show that I've shown at the gallery. Um, and I work a lot with the idea of the fact that it's situated in the law firm. And then there's, so there's another sort of layer of when people come to a law firm, they're often wanting to have resolution to problems and struggles that are about their identity, whether that's deciding to get a divorce or selling a house or whatever it is. And so I like that kind of layering really. Um, and it just was, uh, as soon as the name came, I just knew immediately, you know, all these artists that are part of the show um, and how they were defining identity in such a sort of myriad ways and in such interesting intriguing ways that threading them all together was a joy really um you know and it, it my show is always pretty expansive you know lots of artists lots of works um and it's together in this this um way i suppose to use yet another thread analogy um yeah questions in case um everyone's saying thank you um yeah does anyone else want to say anything uh or we can just stop <laughs> but um yeah in case any of the artists want to ask another artist to work but i can yeah no okay. Well, I will then uh, let you all go and have some lunch. Um, this will be available uh, online at some point. There will also be an online catalogue, um, which we wanted to wait until we did this uh, video uh, before we published that. So Michaela Nettle, our thanks to her for putting together the catalogue. That's looking very beautiful. I've seen it. Uh, there will be an updated foreword on that as well for myself and include your review, David, as well. So thank you so much for that. It means a lot that you all turned up and um, it means a lot for me to have shown the artist's work. Um, I'm really grateful for, for you all uh, that turned up to listen to it. Um, so it's a pleasure. Uh, I'm going to try and screen grab some of these lovely comments for the catalogue. Uh, but you can all go. You can all end your own meetings. and. Um, I hope to see you all again in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Yeah. Rosalind. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. See you, Rosalind. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. See you guys. Bye bye. 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 Oh, well done. I didn't do that, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Grab it. <laughs> Thank See you. See you later. See you.